Good Friday, everybody. Amen. What a blessing to be together. Oh, man. God is so good. All the time, God is good. Well, I hope you have been having a, a very blessed Holy Week. We certainly have. Uh, I have been so thoroughly enjoying our times in the Word this week uh, with Pastor Jay McCarl. We went through the Galilean wedding and all of the wonderful ways that it points to the Lord's work in us as redeeming his bride and promising us an inheritance and an eternity with him. And looking Wednesday at John 15, one of my favorite chapters about abiding in the vine, that, God, that Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches. And the simple truth of our faith that we are simply just to abide in him as he abides in us and we will bear fruit. He promises us that. And on Thursday last night, Nathaniel took us through John 17, the, the wonderful prayer of Jesus as he prays to the Lord for himself and his disciples and finally for believers. And what a blessing that was uh, to see the intimacy of the relationship of the Son and the Father and Jesus modeling this relationship for us. And so I figure tonight we, or today we will continue uh, in John as uh, the Lord just seemed to um, present that as uh, the theme chapter for each of us this week. And uh, before we do get in, a couple of things. We are going to be having our uh, Saturday evening message. Pastor Josh will be sharing with us tomorrow. We'll be right here at 6.30, again at our normal time. And then uh, Easter sunrise, we'll be over in the canyon over at Maidu. We have um, directions there. We have a, um, a flyer that you can see to, um, to go for parking and to, to join us out there in the canyon as the sun comes up. It is a sight to behold. Rain or not, it is a sight. And to think about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, the hope of mankind rising again and conquering sin and death while you watch the sun come up, it is incredible. So please join us for that. Remember to bring a chair and possibly an umbrella and a jacket, and then we'll be in here um, for our normal times on Sunday at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. So if you haven't already, open up with me to John chapter 18. We're going to be looking at John 18 and 19 today. And uh, it's always such a joy to look at the life of Jesus and to examine his last week and to, um, to just dwell on Jesus with his disciples and in prayer and seeking the Father. And like Josh shared, the, the anguish, and uh, I think you drank from, from this one, but that's all right by me. I saw your face going, does he know that I just sipped from that during communion? <laughs> yes, I do, and I do not care. <laughs> it's, it's not the first time you've shared your water with me, but most of the time it's flying through the air when you do share it, so <laughs> thank you, Dave. <laughs> it won't stop me, though. Uh. Can I have that one? <laughs> Dave will bring you one, don't worry. Oh, man. So, you know, one of the things that I love so much about God's Word is that it's so new every time we go through it. <clears throat> we have been going through Holy Week uh, for a few years now and just sharing messages, and we look at the life of Jesus and uh, his, his time in his earthly ministry with his disciples and... Um, you know, some of it can seem routine, but the truth is the Lord has new things to reveal to us each time. And this year, he has been showing me so many incredible things uh, that I've really been enjoying um, that I believe he purposefully keeps from us at some times to reveal them to us in the perfect time. And uh, I was just dwelling on, uh, I was dwelling on the cross this morning uh, as I was as I was in the shower, and I, was just, I just began to cry. And I was just weeping, thinking of the fact that my sin drove my Savior Jesus to the cross. Yeah. That my sin 
nailed him to that cross, and that it was necessary for him to go through the things that he went through and the things that he suffered because of me. And I was, it was just a, an, a really special moment with the Lord, and um, <clears throat> you know, I'm sniffling a little bit, the tears are coming down, not, not super manly, but uh, I hear from the other room, are you crying? And I was like, <laughs> You know, I'm wiping, what? I'm wiping my tears. I'm in the shower. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but I'm wiping them anyways. And Sabrina, and I'm like, huh, babe, was that you? She goes, yeah, babe, are you crying? I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> I'm thinking about the cross. You know, I think the reality is if the cross does not break your heart, then you don't really know Jesus. You don't understand the depth of what he has done and what he accomplished on that cross. It's a powerful thing. And as we go through things, and as we go through John 18 and 19, I know that the Lord has things to share and to speak to each one of us and to reveal to us. Maybe it's something that we've forgotten, you know, that we knew before, but it's just been a while and we need to be refreshed in it. It's, it's kind of one of those things that I love about watching movies you haven't seen for a long time. You know, you kind of forget the storyline and some of the good punchlines, and in a way, you're kind of re-watching it for the first time. Um, I have a pretty good memory. I could tell you Josh's social security number, his credit card numbers, uh, address, how to get into his bank accounts, his passwords. That's why he keeps me on staff. I'm too dangerous to let go. I, I've, le- I've got leverage, you know? I'm set. But I forget things all the time. And uh, the reality is, even as the Lord has blessed me with a good memory, there are things that I constantly need to be reminded of. And it's so good to go back and be refreshed in. And that's very much what we will be doing today. God's word is living and it's powerful and it speaks to us. And it is living and powerful because Jesus is the word and he lives and he makes intercession for us. So, now as uh, we dive into John chapter 18, Jesus has been betrayed by Judas, and they've arrested him in the garden of Gethsemane. And it says here in John chapter 18, verse 12, then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised, advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Remember, he spoke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he didn't even know it. I love to see the sovereignty and the power of God, that even unbelievers carry out his will unknowingly. And in thinking that they are directly contradicting and thwarting the plans of God, they are accomplishing the plans of God, because no one is greater than our God. And his will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. So... Jesus is turned over, and we're told they took him to Annas' palace. Um, Annas had been previously appointed as the high priest of of the Jews by Rome. And, uh, of course, that was not in the law. That was not how things were to be done, but this was all a political game. If Rome could control the leadership and the spiritual leadership of the Jews, then they could control the people. And these guys were leveraged because they thirsted and lusted for power and control. And so they were very easy to manipulate and um, to remove one when it became inconvenient and to put another into place. According to God's law, the high priest was to serve for life, but the Romans didn't like that. And so every 10 years or so or fewer, if it was suited, um, suitable for them, they would appoint another and Um, We see here that Caiaphas is named, and of course, he's the one who prophesied. He's the son-in-law of Annas, and uh, I guess you could say in quotes, officially the high priest. 
at that time, even though, um, once again, he was not high priest according to the law of the Jews, um, but according to the decree of the Romans. Nevertheless, they take him to Annas' house, um, probably while Caiaphas gathered the Sanhedrin so that they could put Jesus on trial at night, which once again, is illegal according to the law of God. I mean, are you seeing the theme here? This whole thing is the scheming of man outside of the law of God and yet fully within the will of God because his Passover lamb is going to be offered up the following day. And according to Jewish uh, timing, it already was being that it was in the evening and, and the early morning hours, it was already the day that they were going to, hours later, put him on the cross and crucify him. So, they take him to Annas's, and, uh, and he's questioned there, and Annas asks him about his disciples and about his doctrine, and... Uh, we know that they took him at night. Why? Well, John, John tells us in John chapter, or Jesus tells us in John chapter 3, that they took Jesus at night and tried him and questioned him at night because they were afraid of the people. Jesus was popular with the people. Jesus says in John chapter 3 that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And those who practice evil hate the light and they stay in the darkness so that their evil deeds will not be exposed. But we know according to God's word that they absolutely will be exposed and they will be judged for those things. Hebrews 4.13 says that all things are naked and open to the eyes of the one to whom we must give account. Nothing escapes his view. No sin is unaccounted for in the ledger of God. So, Jesus is questioned by Annas briefly where he tells him, I spoke openly in the temple. I taught in the synagogue, as the Jews always do. Everything that you're asking of me, you can ask of the people to find out what I've been teaching and what I've been saying. They were trying to catch Jesus in some secret plot that he had to try and overthrow Rome and, and twist it into turning them against him and making him a threat to Caesar. Of course, Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world, but if it was, his servants would fight. So after he's questioned by Annas, he's taken over um, to Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, and they, they, only, they can only find liars to testify against him. This reminds me of uh, that, that game that people play. It's like two truths and a lie, you know? where you'll say a couple of things that are untrue or a couple of things that are true and then there's one lie and people have to guess which one doesn't fit, you know? Well, you got to weigh your character and find out what kinds of things maybe you're slipping in there. And here it was the opposite. It was like two lies and a truth because they bring these accusations that, that Jesus is he's perverting the nation, that he's forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, that, um, that he is making himself God. And of course, the only true statement and the only true accusation that they can come up with is that he makes himself to be the son of God. They mention in this, in this court that Jesus said, finally, there's witnesses who can agree on something that he said and not have different versions of it. And they say that Jesus said he will destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days which affirms his prophecy that he gave on the sign of Jonah. Remember, Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and none will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as he was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. But he promised as they destroy that temple, he'll raise it up again in three days, and it's not quite exactly accurate what they have to say about Jesus. As they, they claim that he said, I will destroy the temple. But the actual quote in John chapter 2, Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Now, 
Jesus also tells us that no one takes my life, but I lay it down of my own free will. And if I lay it down, I, will, I have power to take it back again. No one takes his life from him. And so in a way, both are true. By his own hand, he is destroyed, but by his own hand, he is raised again from the grave. So they find this statement. And finally, as they continue questioning him and and asking him different things, we see here that Jesus stands silent at all the accusations, all these things that they bring against them. He's just silent. He refuses to answer. Here in Mark 14, 61 and 62, it says, he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Jesus said, I am. Ego e me. Those words which affirm fully the deity and the lordship of Christ. Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus says, I am. Jesus Christ is Lord. And he proclaims it over and over through the Gospels. And John writes his Gospel late in his life to affirm this very idea, because there are perverted notions about Jesus and who he was, just like there are today. And there were plenty of people who denied the Lordship and the deity of Christ. And John, writing afterwards, writes with the intention to really magnify the Lord, magnify Jesus as God. And we see here that he absolutely affirms it. And he follows in verse 62 of Mark 14. Jesus says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So the high priest, once again, in breaking the Jewish law, he tears his clothes and he calls out to the Sanhedrin, what more do we need to hear? He's admitted it. He's a blasphemer. He makes himself God. What more do we need to hear? And Leviticus specifically forbids the high priest from tearing his clothing, directly forbidding him from doing that. And yet they had perverted the law of God and made ineffective the word of God by substituting instead the traditions of men and the practices and the ideas of mankind. So they're all decided, most of them, some disagreed, like Joseph of Arimathea. Most of them, they decide that that's all they need to hear. They have the accusations against them. They've, they've caught him in blasphemy. It's a punishable uh, offense. To, it's punishable to the point of death, although because they are dominated and ruled by the Romans, they're not allowed to put anyone to death. So they need the Romans to do that dirty work for them. And once again, it's the plan of God, it's the sovereignty of God, and the fact that he, was, he came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. They rejected him and despised him. But the Jews alone are not responsible for crucifying the Lord of glory. It was the Gentiles who put him on the cross under the extreme pressure from the Jews. No one escapes from the guilt of the cross. Not a single one, not Jew, not Gentile, but all of mankind's sin put him there. So Jesus, as the Passover lamb, has been going through this final inspection, if you will, by the Jewish leaders. Remember, we talked a couple weeks ago uh, about how Jesus was under scrutiny in the temple as he taught every single day after the triumphal entry. He was in the temple teaching daily, and the leaders were afraid to go and seize him because he was so popular and because the people would not have stood for it. Jesus was their champion. He was their king. They welcomed him in as a king, crying Hosanna. And Jesus was in the temple, and they were asking him questions, and they were examining him, examining him to see if there was any spot or blemish in him to see if there was any unclean thing in him, if they could catch him in a lie or something that was against 
God's law. And it was the Lord's opportunity to showcase his perfect lamb and say, he's perfect and he's sinless and he's spotless. He is the perfect sacrifice, the once and for all final sacrifice for mankind. So now his final examination before the Jews and the only thing that they can find against him is actually the truth, that he makes himself the son of God and he fully claims lordship and deity. They had no misconceptions about what Jesus said about himself. They were not confused. They knew fully what Jesus claimed and what he said. And yet some today take ignorance and they claim Jesus didn't actually say those things, but they affirm it here and they send them over to Pilate because they're going to get Pilate to put him on the cross. Josh read during communion, Isaiah, or during a call to worship, Isaiah 53, verse 7, that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. All the false accusations he refused to answer. But when they put him under oath by the living God, and when Pilate comes and questions him, he's silent until Pilate says this. Let's jump to John chapter 8, verse 37. Actually, we'll go back to 36 since I mentioned this earlier. In John 18, 36, Jesus answered. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. An unbelieving Gentile spends minutes with Jesus, questioning him, and can see the truth of his statement and of his character. You know, regardless of what Pilate's motivations were for making this comment, their speculation, what is truth? The irony is that he's speaking to the way, the truth, and the life. And that the very one that he asks this question of is the answer. I mean, the blindness of sin, the blindness that we have when we are not surrendered to the Lord, when we resist his will, when we push back against his will for our lives, how blind we are, how blind sin makes us. You know, the reality is that Pilate clearly didn't love the truth because he could see it clearly, and yet still he goes out and he offers Jesus up to them. And he washes his hands, which means nothing. Just because you say you have no sin doesn't mean it's true. Whoever says he has no sin makes God a liar. And the truth is not in him. The truth was not in Pilate. He didn't love the truth. And we know that those who don't receive the love of the truth, the only alternative is the lie. It's one or the other. We, have the, we either receive Jesus and believe the truth of God's word, or we believe any lie that Satan throws out there for us. It doesn't have to be two truths and a lie. It could be three lies, and then we'll buy them hook, line, and sinker. One after the other, if it's self-serving, just as it was here for Pilate. You know, this statement reminded me when Jesus says that he came into the world and he should bear witness to the truth, for everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. When Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. One of the 
when he begins that second paragraph, he says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thomas Jefferson affirms that truth is self-evident. It is easy to recognize because it is solid and it, it is uh, built on a rock-solid foundation. And when we look at the Word and when we read the, the words of Jesus, we see that the truth of God's Word is self-evident. The Holy Spirit comes and He convicts us of the truth of the Word, and we have that choice. Just like Pastor Jay McCarl was talking about the betrothal ceremony between the bride-to-be and the bridegroom-to-be, when he takes that cup of the wine and he offers it to his bride-to-be. And she has that choice. It's the only point in the whole process. She actually has a choice. And she can either receive that cup and drink of it, and the bridegroom longs for that to happen. He desires that she would, that she would receive this betrothal, and that they would be married together, and that this covenant would be till death, that they would be one, as it was from the beginning when God made Adam and Eve, and the two became one flesh. And now here, we have that same opportunity to receive. Are we going to receive the cup and say, yes, Lord, I believe? I receive these things as true. I, I want to be yours. I want to turn away from my sin. I want to be with you forever, Lord. Us two becoming one. We all are given this opportunity because God is good and righteous and he's a just judge. And each one of us, he longs for to be in his kingdom. He desires that all men would be saved that none would perish, but that all would come to the knowledge of the truth. So, bringing it back to Pilate and Jesus, Pilate didn't love the truth. He loved something else himself. He was seeking to save his own skin with Caesar because he was already in hot water. And he knew that if he released someone who was a king. And he ended up causing problems for Caesar. And it got back to him that Pilate released this guy who leads an uprising against Caesar. He was done. So knowing the truth, he rejected it and he, prefer, he perverted justice and turned Jesus over to them. But before he did that, he sends him over to Herod because he learns that he's a Galilean. And that's Herod's jurisdiction. So Jesus goes before Herod, and Herod's eager and excited to see him. Remember, he had already cut John the Baptist's head off when John the Baptist was calling him out for his wicked and heinous sin that he was involved in. Herod wanted to see Jesus as a curiosity, just like, just like many today. They just wanted to see some miracle. They just wanted to see something, some fireworks some unexplainable supernatural phenomena. They wanted to, he wanted to see Jesus do some magic tricks. And we're told Jesus didn't say a word to him. He stood there silent. As they beat him, as they mocked him, as they blasphemed him, like a sheep before his shearers, he didn't open his mouth. He was silent. And there are many today who ask about Jesus. They want to see signs from Jesus. They want to see some miracle. And yet they're not actually seeking Jesus himself. And the Lord will not reveal himself to someone like that. He won't answer someone who doesn't truly want to know, who's not truly desiring to know the truth and to receive the truth and to love the truth. So Herod sends him back to Pilate, and in Luke's gospel in chapter 23, it says that Pilate and Herod were enemies before that point, but they became friends this day, because they now had a common enemy. 
But, you know, it reminds me of James's letter in James 4.4 4, when he says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. If you embrace the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. You're either with the Lord, you're either with Jesus as he says, or you're against him. There's no on the fence, there's no in-between. There's no in-between between truth and lie. There's no in-between between light and darkness. There's no fellowship together between those two things. There's no fellowship between the world and with God. It's one or the other. In Pilate's fellowship, his friendship was with the world. It was with Herod. If you embrace the world, you make yourself an enemy of God because the things of the world and the things of man stand in direct contrast with God's ways and with his law and with his word. The pride of man exalts itself against the Lord. And man trades the glory of the incorruptible for the corruptible. Things made in man's image, like ourselves, or dumb idols, or idols of creeping things. We trade the glory of God in rejecting the truth. And when we do so, the only alternative is the lie. It's the darkness. Many have chosen the darkness, and they will continue to do so, sadly, even though, like I mentioned, the heart of God is that all men would be saved. As he, as he looks over Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who stones the prophets and kills those who are sent to her. How I longed to gather you into my arms as a mothering hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. They rejected the truth and they rejected Jesus. They chose themselves instead. And Pilate, trying to appease the people, because they were so adamant that Jesus be crucified, a man whom he clearly told them multiple times, I find no fault in him. He's innocent. He's done nothing wrong. Here, I'll, I'll beat him, and I'll punish him, and then I'll give him back to you. And still, the cry, the, the Greek describes that this was one chant together. Crucify! Crucify! He offers them a choice between Jesus and Barabbas. And ironically, one of the accusations they bring against the Lord is that he was perverting the nation, that he was a threat to Caesar, and that he might be leading an insurrection and an uprising. And here is Barabbas, a known murderer and insurrectionist, and they choose Barabbas instead of Jesus. I mean, the insanity of sin. They're out of their right minds. And when Pilate washes his hands and says, I'm innocent of this man's blood, which was a lie, they say, let his blood be upon our heads and on our children's heads. What a thing to say. How heinous is that? And it's true, in 70 AD, the Romans had enough. They leveled the place. They routed the Jews. It was a horrible, horrible judgment and condemnation because they had rejected their Messiah. They had rejected their king. They shouted amidst the cries for crucifixion, we have no king but Caesar. Israel, when they spoke to Samuel when he was old, they said, look, you're old. We don't want you anymore. We don't want to be ruled by God anymore. We want to be like all the other nations of the earth. Give us a king. Who, a man? A man who would pervert justice, who would exalt himself in his own pride, who would lead the people away from God? They cry again here, we have no king but Caesar. Tragic words. Tragic words. At this point, we move into John chapter 19. In John chapter 19, verse 8, it says, Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, 
because they accused Jesus of making himself the son of God and blaspheming. He was, he was afraid of such, such a statement about this man whom he was standing before. He went back into Jesus in the praetorium and he said, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate, frustrated, says to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And so Pilate, afraid, sought to release him, but the people wouldn't have it. And so Pilate gives in to that mob mentality. It wins out over justice. Those who were put in place to be leaders, who were given authority, who were given power from above, as Romans 13 tells us, all authority is given by God and that we ought to submit to those authorities. Jesus tells him, you have no power against me unless it's given you from above. But they won't have it. So instead of justice, he goes with the people. Doesn't that sound familiar? I mean, the same thing has been happening throughout all of human history. We long for justice, true justice righteousness. I mean, how many cry out, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood upon those who dwell on the earth? They'll cry out in Revelation and during the great tribulation, how long, O Lord, faithful and true, how long? He says to Cain, the blood of your brother Abel cries out to me from the ground. The Lord sees all of it. There's no injustice that escapes him. And it's true that each one of us that experiences injustice in our lives, he's with us. He knows. He can relate to us. He says, yeah, they, they, fore, they forewent all justice for me. They traded it for the mob, for the cries of crucifixion. So now moving to John chapter 19, verse 17. Let's read it. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. They would have crucified Jesus right next to the road so that all who were coming into the city, remember he was crucified on the north side of the city, and all who were coming into the city would have passed by, and we read that they mocked him, that they fulfilled those scriptures and prophecies. Physician, heal thyself, as Jesus promised them, they would say. If you are the Son of God, come down off of that cross and save yourself. Then we'll believe you. Save yourself. Prophet, save yourself. I mean, the the wickedness of man and the cruelty in man's heart is on full display here. As by the time Jesus is sent to the cross, he had been continually beaten by the Jews and the Gentiles. He was mocked, spat upon, scourged, blasphemed, marred beyond recognition with his beard plucked out and a crown of thorns driven into his skull, a mock robe and scepter given to him, hail the king of the Jews as they mock their creator and their Lord, the one who breathed life into their very lungs and gave them that breath to use to mock him. 
humanity pours out his worst on Jesus. Isaiah 52, 14 says, Just as many were astonished at you, so his vis- visage, his image was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Why? Why did Jesus have to go through such suffering? Why was he subjected to these things? The perfect son of God, the one who turned nobody away, but healed the sick, cast out the demons, made the lame to walk again, the blind to see, the one who brought hope into the world and promised that he didn't come to condemn the world or to judge the world, but to save the world, to save them from their own sins. Why? Why is all of this poured out on him? It's the worst of sin. It's the worst that mankind has to offer. It's the reality of what's in our hearts. You know, that we're all terminal. We're all sick with sin. We're all utterly and completely corrupt. For David says, my mother brought me forth in iniquity. From the very beginning, I was corrupted with sin. From the moment that Adam and Eve chose themselves instead of God in the garden, the moment that they said, my will be done instead of the Lord's, they chose sin. And what are the wages of sin? Only death. The only result of choosing something other than God, the Lord of life, the God of the living, the one who made all things to live, not to die, not to rot and decay. He made all things to live. And Adam and Eve rebelled against God and chose their own way, and so innocent blood had to be shed for them. An innocent lamb was killed so that their shame could be covered. Abraham takes Isaac up on Mount Moriah, And God stops him, and he says, Abraham, Abraham, do not harm the lad, for surely I know that you would not withhold even your own son from me. I will provide the sacrifice. And there's a lamb caught in the thicket, ready for them. Exodus 12, the Israelites are in Egypt, and they've been slaves, they've been oppressed, they've been afflicted, they've been suffering They've been crying out to the Lord for 400 years. And that last 10th plague, he says, you're going to kill a lamb, a perfect spotless lamb, a male in its prime, in its first year. And you're going to put that blood on the lentils and on the doorposts, and it's going to cover you in your sins. And if you do that, I'll pass over you. But it says there was not a single household in Egypt where there wasn't someone slain inside. It's been God's story and his plan throughout all of history that he would send his perfect lamb to die for the sins of the world. He was slain before the foundation of the world. All of humanity and all of their sin and all of the evil, wicked things that we've done, all a fever pitch, needing justice, And the answer is Jesus. Jesus himself, the propitiation, he's enough. He's the sacrifice. The one who takes away the sins of the world, as John so sweetly prophesied when Jesus came. Imagine the joy that he had when he said that. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And like Josh mentioned, all of the sins that had already been committed. All of those committed against Jesus there and all the ones that would follow, all of man's history, it was all born by Jesus. And he took it upon his shoulders and nailed it to the cross. All these things against Jesus. It's the worst of sin, the worst of man. It's the worst of Satan and his rebellion against God and God's plan to redeem and save his people whom Satan hates. Jesus was being tested to the fullest. 
sent to the outer limits that no man could possibly withstand except the God-man. It's impossible that anyone could bear the sins of the world. No one, no one had the right. No one, according to the law, was spotless except Jesus. He was tested to the fullest, and yet still, he did not disobey the will of the Father, but, but prayed to him, Father, not my will, but your will be done. The question that Satan was posing to Jesus was what he had tempted him with before, what Adam and Eve had been tempted with. Will you deny your father and choose yourself? Will you desire to save yourself? And Jesus, our champion, says, I will not deny the Father. I will glorify the Father. Praise God. So they take Jesus, and after all of these things, they nail him to the cross and hang him on the tree in accordance with the prophecy that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus bore the curse. He took the curse. He conquered the curse. He triumphed over the curse of sin and death. He nailed the handwriting of requirements which stood over us and separated us from the perfection and the glory of God. He took that, he fulfilled the law, and he nailed it to the cross and left it there, taking it out of the way. In the midst of all this, I want to look finally at the seven times that Jesus speaks from the cross. I love that number seven. And I love looking at Jesus and just beholding him fully and completely. I remember um, the, uh, the communion song that we used to sing sometimes, singing about the cross. And it says, There you took my sin away. You healed me on that darkened day. Jesus, you have made a way for me. Jesus, you have made a way for me. Jesus hanging on the cross does something else that no natural man could possibly do. But he prays to the Father and he says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. I mean, to think of it, that they had given him their worst that the full evil of mankind was leveraged against Christ, that the wrath of God on sin was poured out on his own son. And in the midst of all that, in his final hours, he goes, Father, forgive them. That forgiveness is of God alone. That is not within me. That is not within you. That is not within mankind's heart to do. We hate people for far less. They could look at us sideways and we got something against them. And here Jesus takes the fullness of the wrath of God, the wrath of man and the mockery and the shame of our sin he bears. And that's his prayer. Forgive them, Lord. Man, the power, the power of the love of God. The power of God in saving us and giving us salvation and saving us from our sins and, and our own wickedness. Secondly, he's crucified between two criminals, and they even are mocking him. And I loved that message last year during Good Friday, talking about Jesus with the thieves on the cross. And how that's us. We deserve to be up there. That's where we rightly belong, is right there on that cross. And yet one of them, he has a change of heart. He's got true repentance in his heart. And he looks on Jesus and he sees the self-evident truth of his Lord and Savior as he hangs there. And he says, Father, forgive them. He hears these words. He sees and his eyes are opened. And he says, what are we doing? We deserve this. He doesn't. He's innocent. 
And I love those Lord's, Lord, rem- those words, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Lord, your kingdom, remember me. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thirdly, once again, the love of Christ and the love of God. He looks down at his mother, his precious mother who hasn't left his side. The one who brought him into the world. The one who was so eager for him to reveal his glory at that wedding in Cana. The one who said, Jesus, there's no more wine left. What can you do? Whatever Jesus says, you just do it, okay? She's so excited for him. The love of a mother, how powerful it is. And he looks down at Mary and he looks at John and he says, Woman, behold your son. And he says to John, Behold your mother. And John tells us from that very hour, John took, us, took her back to his home. I mean, how precious and how intimate that moment is. He cared for her so much. And like you mentioned, he probably knew that John was going to... Well, of course he knew. <laughs> Peter asks him after his resurrection, Okay, Lord, I know how I'm going to die now, but what about John? And he goes, what's that got to do with you? Whether he dies or whether maybe he's alive until the resurrection, what does that have to do with you? He knew that she would be safe with John, that she would be cared for and loved. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. The fourth thing that he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me as Jesus is broken by the weight of the sins of the world, of the sins of every single human being of all time? He's broken by it. Darkness covers the earth. That fellowship that he had with the Lord, he now feels the sting of sin. He feels the judgment of God heartbreaking. Why have you forsaken me? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The fifth thing that Jesus says is, I thirst. He had refused the the vinegar mixed with the the gall or the myrrh to be a little painkiller. You know, it helps them to uh, ease the suffering a little bit on the cross, and that wasn't what the Lord had for him. He drank the full cup of the wrath of God. And of course, he had work still to do on the cross as he saved the thief, the repentant one, who cried out to Jesus for his mercy. Jesus says, I thirst. And they give him the vinegar and the gall to drink. When he says that, I thirst. I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Do you thirst for the living waters? Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me, and I'll give to him the water of life to drink freely. And out of him will flow torrents of living water. He will become a fountain of the living water. Because that's the natural effect that Jesus has on each one who comes and drinks of those waters. It's that abiding in Christ and letting him abide in us. And I loved what Mike mentioned about not being focused on the fruit, being focused on the root and just firmly fixing our eyes upon Jesus and just beholding him and being transformed by him and dwelling in his presence, the fruit will come. Jesus is faithful and good to bring the fruit, brothers and sisters. Amen? Amen. 
We're not to be worried about how much fruit we can bear, whether that's thief on the cross sized fruit or Billy Graham sized fruit. We're not to be worried about that. The good works have been prepared in Christ Jesus beforehand that we should walk in them, that we should enjoy our Lord, that we should magnify the Lord Jesus in our hearts. Like Nathaniel mentioned, that Jesus supremely glorifies God, and so therefore the fullness that we have of Jesus within us will glorify the Father as well. That as we have that water of life within ourselves, the torrent of living waters will flow out onto all of those around us. As we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we'll be filled. And brothers and sisters, each one of us who has thirsted unto salvation and cried out to the Lord, he's faithful and just to save us and to give us salvation so that we'll never thirst for it again giving us his Holy Spirit and sealing us for that day as a promise, giving us confidence and assurance in the completed work of Jesus Christ and the safety that we have in his will for our lives, the safety that we have in his family. If you haven't yet been satisfied and your thirst for salvation. We're going to pray in a few minutes. And I want you to take this opportunity to pray and cry out to the Lord for salvation and for those living waters which he promises to give freely. The sixth thing that Jesus says from the cross, and isn't it so appropriate that this is the sixth, the sixth cry of Jesus to tell us die. It is finished. What sweet words. What sweet words from our Savior. I, sweeter words maybe haven't been spoken. That the culmination of God's plan for humanity and his work from before the world was even formed, his plan for us to be redeemed and restored back to him in a perfect and a holy matrimony with the Lord our God who created each one of us. The work is finished. Jesus has completed it. It's the sixth thing, the number of man. Man's salvation has been accomplished. It has been won. God as man has come and fulfilled the perfect law. And now, instead of bondage and slavery, he offers freedom. Because it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. And he's broken those chains off of us. And he promises us life, eternal life, that more abundantly. We haven't yet comprehended or understood what it truly means to have life more abundantly, but we will know one day. We'll know the fullness of what that means. That's our blessed hope that we have. Finally, Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And saying this, he breathed his last. Here in John chapter 19, Verse 30, when Jesus received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit, just as he promised. No one takes my life. I give it up of my own free will. And if I lay it down, I have power to take it back again. Conquering over the grave and promising resurrection to each one of us who believes and the one that the Lord has sent on our behalf, who believes in our Savior, who promises us resurrection and new bodies. A few verses that I want to share before we finish here. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He finished the work. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's the propitiation, the payment in full for our sins so that they're remembered no more. That God, who is eternal, who forgets nothing, 
remembers our sins no more, and they're blotted out. And instead, our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. We who were dead in our trespasses, he has made alive together with him. He poured out the fullness of his wrath on his own son so that we could escape from that wrath. And now finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Some of my favorite verses. The Lord says, In an acceptable time I have heard you. And in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the day. I want everyone to bow their heads and pray to the Father, knowing that tomorrow is too late. The psalmist says that even at his strength, even at his prime, man is but vapor. And vapor vanishes in the blink of an eye, Lord, just like our lives are so fleeting here. But Lord, you give each of us opportunities to cry out to you. And we know your word says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you do not have that confidence of salvation, if you thirst for salvation, if, you, if your soul is dissatisfied and you feel an emptiness there where there should be the Lord God himself, where there should be Jesus abiding within you and making your body his temple and his dwelling place, then it's as simple as praying, Father, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, I know that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Lord, I receive your free gift of eternal life and I repent of my old ways. And I believe, Lord, that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new. as simple as that. If you pray that prayer today, you're a new creation. You're saved. You're sealed. You are adopted into the family of God himself. And Jesus is well pleased to call you a brother, a sister, a friend, co-inheritor of all things that the Father will give to his Son. Lord, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for suffering through that, Lord, and paying the price, bearing the sins, Lord, that none of us could bear, living a perfect, sinless life, Lord. It's heartbreaking to look at the cross, but we know, Lord, for the joy that was set before you, you endured it. You looked to that blessed Sunday, Lord, when you would rise again, when you would take captivity captive and you would give gifts to men. Lord, I stand in awe as you tore the curtain in two from top to bottom, as you sent the earthquake and shook open those graves, Lord, as you sent a clear message that even the Roman centurion recognized, surely this was, no, surely this is the Son of God. Thank you, Lord, for resurrection and for making us new. Thank you for loving us first so that we could love you. Lord, all of these things, Lord, we commit them into your hands. And we pray that you would bless us and that you would keep us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.